This is a continued discussion from the previous episode of Nose to Tail, a podcast where we explore the world of aviation lifecycle solutions, insights, and more. Presented by Jet Midwest. Obviously, coffee as a career is one piece, but you're a huge aviation enthusiast. But if the people behind us could see you on the roof of your factory, uh, you actually have mounted a full DC-3 on a takeoff ramp yeah. that's lit. It's beautiful. You can see it from the highway in Kansas City. And it really has become a, a huge, iconic piece of the landscape here, which uh, you've got to be super proud of. But maybe you can talk about your enthusiasm for aviation and kind of how that spawned and where maybe that's been uh, integrated in your life. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm just nonstop curious all day, every day, just curious. And so that was intrinsic, came from within. I don't know where it came from. I just always loved it, right? And and as I mentioned, I wasn't even on a jet till I was 18 years old. But dad took us like uh, one time we were in Sioux City and we had, did a helicopter ride and they went under the bridge over the river and stuff. Just, oh, I get goosebumps right now. And that was in the 60s, right? So I always loved it. And then this will sound really weird. I've never talked to anybody else who had this happen to him, but... I dream fairly often when I'm flying without a plane. I'm flying like this in my stupid dreams. I'll wake up and I'll think, oh my God, I'm starting to fall. I got to, you know, I got to do that. It's it's embarrassing, but I just love that feeling and love the whole idea of it. And I don't really know where it came from. There was a cool guy in Iowa, but this small town, I was in, he put a aircraft motor on a tractor and it had in a tractor pole and i was probably <laughs> nine or ten years old and i was enamored with that i thought oh my god i want one of those i'm going to do that it's funny you were talking about your dream i've had this recurring dream for most of my adult life that i stole an airplane oh. that i went to like a small municipal airfield and got on like a one cessna 150 or something and just took off and then i'm kind of having this realization is I'm kind of flying around and I could see everything and it's, it's cool experience. And I'm going, I don't know how to land this. Oh, I, no. I took this airplane. I don't know how to land it. And then essentially I'd be trying to land this airplane and I would wake up at the end of the stream. Are you have like, yeah. hyperventilating when you wake um, up? I mean, or is it, is no, it a bad it, dream or is it? A... No, it's not a bad dream. I just kind of like come to and, and I, I, I've had that same dream a hundred times. It's, That's the most, it's the most, it's the most bizarre. I do not know what caused it. And I'm always like, Oh, I could just do this. I can just go oh, look and yeah, all of a sudden I'm up in the air. I don't know how to fly an airplane. <laughs> you know, I don't have the foggiest. I couldn't get off the ground. Oh my gosh. Uh, but it, but it's been something recurring and again, very similar. Mm -hmm. It was the sensation of being in the air and, and being able to control the airplane as it's moving oh, around. And, gosh. Um, I've been lucky enough to sit second seat a couple of times in a private aircraft where I've been able to be in control of the aircraft mm -hmm. a little bit. And, and that sensation is pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And once you kind of push, at least in my case, you push through that reticence, you know, a little bit. I always found it really intuitive, you know, and, and if you were a dunce, you'd think, well, this is easy. How hard can flying be? The takeoff and landing is quite a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> the flying part was intuitive. What little, you know, what little bit I had, I, I think together, I probably maybe have 15 or 16 hours, but I think now I want to go do, I'm going to try it again. When I had that sandwich, as I talked to you a couple weeks ago about sandwiched between travel Monday through Friday and doing my MBA and working at the roast, you know, just building a company. And it was just w wedged in and maybe we had 20 knot winds or, you know, couldn't fly or two weeks would go by and didn't have time to look at the ground school stuff. And the instructors would be, uh, you know, annoyed <laughs> with me. But I think today I could probably be more mindful and and more deliberate with it and pick it back up again, I think. Yeah. If I can find one I can fit in. I would encourage you to let's let's find that for you. Yeah. Um, and then you'll either discover again whether that's something you want to continue or whether it's something that you maybe you don't want to. But right. at least scratch that itch that's, a little bit, I think, would be good. That's it, yeah. You know, I've always wondered, and I, I don't think I know the, if there is even a story behind it, but why the, I don't know, is it an obsession with DC-3? Yeah. What, what, what's specific about that airplane maybe particularly uh, intrigues you? So... And I think that just came, you know, and from uh, intrinsic as well. But even when you mention it, I think about Batman and Gotham City and then City Hall and this Art Deco. Mm -hmm. And and I think about, I just got goosebumps thinking about that. Or the front of a really cool Art Deco train from the 30s locomotive, you know. And the DC-3 fit that for me. I just love the curves and the 
voluptuousness of it. And then it can at once kind of be chubby. And, and then when I got to know more about it, every I loved the looks first and foremost. And then it was the first plane, I think, in the world designed, the first plane that could haul enough people and pay for itself and not have to be subsidized. Right. So 22 or 24 people, and it paid its own way. It kind of revolutionized everything, right? And then learning about the role it played in World War II. And then I'd be in, you know, Africa or Sumatra or someplace, and I'd see them all over. Oh, my God, I have some crazy pictures of sitting in them in different places. You just They'd let me crawl up in there and take a picture yeah. of the pilot, as a pilot, you know. And they're still hauling coffee once in a while. I've never been to Papua New Guinea, but I know they're still using them in Papua New Guinea. So it just kind of checked every box, you know. It was like first of many things, the, the way it looked, how tough it is and how it can take a punch and keep going, you know. And then they called Puff the Magic Dragon. Um, they took one and they did in Vietnam. And uh, I can't remember what they said. It was this, the C-47 version, which we had one of those at the farm too for a while. I had it out in the pasture. And I would just sit there like an idiot. But I would just look at it. I'd drive my gator down there and just look at it, you know. In fact, one time when we started, we put this, it was up by Excelsior Springs. We put that C-47 out there. So it, on the, the pilot, is it says Captain Terry O'Neill, our son. And then the, the co-pilot is Sophie O'Neill on the other side and the co-pilot. One time we were up there on Friday night and we started having all these low uh, flyovers, you know, all these different planes and they cause checking out there, what the hell is this? So we had <laughs> built a runway cause we wanted to land it there. So my son and I did a whole bunch of earth work and cut down a bunch of gnarly trees to make it a runway. And the guy who was going to land it kind of chickened out. So we had to take it apart and put it back together up there. But Terry was like, my son goes, dad, dad, go down. Let's wave him down. Let's wave him down. So it was this guy in this yellow ultralight, and we waved him down, so he landed. And we're talking, and he, he looks at my son. He goes, you want to go for a ride? And my daughter goes, no, and she was too afraid. I couldn't talk her into it, and Terry goes, I'll go. And he goes, what do you weigh? And he said, 80 pounds. So Terry went with him, and they took off. And so my daughter was maybe seven or eight years old at the time, and I are standing there, and I'm like, oh, shit. And my wife's not there. I, think, <laughs> I don't know his name. <laughs> so I wasn't as afraid of him not coming back as I was my wife coming down <laughs> and finding out that I didn't know any of that information before I let him go up in the plane. Oh, my God. Well, the, um, the great news is we can edit this if she's still unaware. That's it. That she knows now. Okay, but, okay. That's good. But no worries. But in Vietnam, they called it spooky, and they took three Gatling guns up the left side and it could put a bullet every square foot, like the size of a football field, every minute. And it, it'd go like this, and they train that gun, those guns, on a target. And the Vietnamese called it Puff the Magic Dragon because it looked like it was just raining fire down from the sky. And they had one guy with a corn shovel just shoveling out all the spent cartridges. So all those different stories. And then they opened up the back, and they could just take a great pallets of stuff and just yep. shove it in there, you know. I just loved all that. So, but well, mainly the look. Sorry for a long story. No, no, I love the story, and, and uh, you're absolutely correct about the look. I, I, I love the polished mm. look; is awesome, yeah. you know. And it's really intriguing, right? So, American Airlines put the first orders in for for those, right? And you're absolutely correct; it was the first profitable per seat mile, right, that you actually had, and that changed aviation because the previous aviation was really built around the mail route mm -hmm. because the only way that they were able to make enough revenue to fly the flight was to carry the mail in the belly. So they were beholden to the mail routes as opposed to where do the passengers actually want to go. And you're pretty amazing, right? So it was the first uh, New York to Chicago oh. route, right? That you could fly that nonstop versus having to stop two or three times. They uh, could fly previous, from New York to Chicago nonstop. 1,500 nautical miles. Wow, That's I didn't the, know that. Yeah. That had to really be something yep. back then. And then obviously being in Kansas City, we have a huge uh, passion around TWA. And TWA went with uh, overnight service so that you could fly. I think it was two stops from New York to L.A. LA. The sleepers. Uh, yeah, you'd, and they, had, they were turned it into sleepers, so a little, some fewer people. But I don't know, it's probably only a $300 ticket. Yeah. Still is today, I think, but uh, it's a little less comfortable. 
So I don't remember where I saw it, but I remember some stories and pictures of the people at the downtown airport doing that route and all kinds, every star, you know, at, at the time stopped here for that because all everybody who was going to LA, you know, yep, that's really cool. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard stories from uh, guys who are pilots. In fact, if I found out that you had a pilot that was too scared to land on your uh, homemade runway, you should have called me because oh. I, I bet I know a couple guys who are pretty cavalier out there that probably could have taken care of it. Uh, I actually did talk to a pilot who flew a DC-3, and he said it was so smooth. Oh. And he goes, it was just kind of slow to react to everything, but it was just the thing almost like, it was almost like a surfboard in the sky that it would just kind of glide around because uh, I'm guessing it just had great lift dynamics to it, the way yeah. that it was designed. You know, one other thing, when we put the plane up that your folks helped us put together, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the credit for that belongs to Elizabeth with um, Atelier Architecture. We chose her to do the factory remodel, and we wanted a plane on the top. I said, I just, I don't want it sticking like a stick. I don't want it to look like a hot dog on a stick. But we had no idea. We did not do the runway or anything like that. So we had a competition where we paid, um, I can't remember how many thousands of dollars to everybody, but the winner took all, whoever we chose, and it was them. And then, so we said, oh my God, you win. They were all kinds of... Uh, infrastructure things that we need we, we needed to be able to do a tour while we're roasting coffee the uh, ups had to be able to come at the same time and all these complications right. right and she goes wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute and then she showed us that it was the runway oh my god i just got goosebumps on that too and i was i couldn't stand it i loved it so much so the day we put that up six mile an hour winds were the maximum because they got the largest crane they could get to fit there, I can't remember, but we were maxed out. So they had to pick it up like this and turn it all the way around and you know and face it the way it's facing right now. So it was supposed to go up at six. So I came down and it's so funny, you have kids, right? Yep. So my first, when my first kid was born, I was not ready for how it was gonna make me feel, <laughs> right? I was scared and nervous and just, it's hard to describe. Well, that's how I felt with the plane too. And I thought, oh my God, I was just kind of blindsided me. So it was like 7, 7, 15, 7, 30. I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's yeah. Get it up, get it up. Well, there are a whole bunch of people running around, and they had all these little flags. I didn't know this about the six mile an hour. And it was eight or nine mile an hour. I don't remember. But we didn't have enough money to do it again. I never thought it was going to be an option of not doing it, right? It wasn't right. even in my, but only later did I hear, a day or two or three later, that it, had it not dropped to below six, they weren't going to put it up, and they kept avoiding me. But I wasn't, I wasn't conscious of it. There were yeah. news cameras. Well, that, you, you, you obviously have a good crew of people. I mean, I think about how nervous you got to be. You're taking these two massive passions of yours and literally stacking them on top of each other. Oh. So I can, I can see how that's, that's but, pretty important. But that day, Bob Dodson had a bunch of his friends, and there were six, seven, or eight of pilots who did the Burma run, mm -hmm. the bump. I think they called it. And they said, oh, it just gave me goosebumps too. But they said, so that was into China, right? And they said they didn't even need a map because there were so many crashed DC-3s on the mountain. They could just follow the crashes all the way. <laughs> and uh, But they just had tears running down their eyes when the uh, DC-3 went up that day. That's awesome. What, yeah. what an epic story. And it does look awesome. Well, listen, it's probably time for us to wind down a little bit. And again, Danny, thank you so much oh, for being great here. To this be has here. been such a good dialogue. We'll definitely have to have round two of this. Come back to your man cave maybe uh, in a couple of months and uh, find another time to tell some good stories and, and talk a little bit more. So for all of you out there, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe. This has been Nose to Tail uh, with Danny O'Neill. Thank you so much, Danny. It's been awesome. Awesome to and, have you. Uh, uh, appreciate everybody watching. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Nose to Tail. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Presented by Jet Midwest.